my name is Carsten Kiel. I'll be chairing this session. It's the final session on uh, DDI software. We'll be having three talks this afternoon, each 20 minutes, if time permits a question then, and we'll have 15 minutes of question afterwards. Um, you can ask questions with the Q&A fun Q function of Zoom, or you can also post them in the Discord. Um, we'll keep a look on that as well. Um, if you do want to speak, you can also use the raise your hand function. Um, obviously, you don't have to raise your hand through the entire talk. Do it when we come to the session, uh, to the question session. The first talk um, will be given by Klaus Peter Klaus from GESIS. Peter is team leader of the team data and service engineering at the department WTS in GESIS. He's responsible on the technical side for several infrastructure projects like DARA DE, the SESTA controlled vocabulary manager, the SESTA EQB, or the upload portal Datorium Soviet Datanet. In all the projects, DDI plays a major role and Peter drives the DDI infrastructure within GESIS from a technical view based on the DDI FlatDB architecture. His research background is in user-oriented information retrieval and digital libraries and long-term preservation. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my first talk um, will be a demonstrator, actually. Um, I will just um, start with the slides and let's see that I can share them now with the screens. So share screen, yes, and screen number two. So you should see my, my slides now. Um, so the first talk is about our DDI-based question editor. Um, we developed um, we developed over the years and also we presented over the years our questionnaire editor and uh, we come now closely to an end with the development and the usage can be opened. Um, the agenda for today's talk will be that I share with you the uh, original use cases and usage scenarios and then I will jump directly into the questionnaire editor application and give you a little demonstration on how to create a questionnaire, how to create a study, how to create a, a question. And then I will just uh, give you some perspectives of the tool. Um, as Carsten said in the introduction, um, in GESIS we focus uh, heavily on DDI and in this case the specific DDI lifecycle 3.2 CMM format and all our tools, tools that we develop gather around this central DDI FlatDB storage which you can see in the middle. Around this is our model layer which is our DDI entities and based on the DDI entities we develop our tools like the questionnaire editor or um, a, vari a variable search or the European question bank that we work together with Chester and also the upcoming editors for editing studies and variables um, will be based on that um, EDI FlatDB environment. The main functional requirements of the question editor are as usual you need to create, edit, and manage questions. You want to arrange questionnaires in restructuring them. You want to translate questions from one language, from the social language to the target language. You usually want to have various exports of uh, uh, word export, uh, export to uh, online survey forms. Um, if you work in a, a collaborative environment, you also want to have a collaborative functionality and you want to have a workflow support so you know where you are in, in creating or discussing or finalizing a questionnaire. It should be possible to import also older questionnaires that you had in some format, SDDI. Um, you want to actually trace questions over time so if you have waves of questions and surveys, you want to know in a specific questionnaire 
okay, where was the question run prior? And as I said, there are collaborative functions like discussion, discussion forum or a tax in order to uh, filter out questions. Um, I, will, I will go now to the demonstrator. Let me see that I get my screen up and running. So do you see now also the, the uh, browser and the question editor? Or do you still see the... Yes, we can see your brother. Okay, well, wonderful. So um, I will just start from the beginning here. So if I log into the questionnaire editor <laughs> and you can already, I'm already logged in because the single sign on um, was activated. So I'm now logged in as uh, myself. <laughs> um, what you see here is, I will switch to English. What you see here is that um, uh, you can select questionnaires here, and that is each study is actually connected to a study group. Um, in this uh, external uh, tool here, you see that there is a, a questionnaire from uh, colleagues in North Macedonia and um, our own uh, CIS group. Each of these groups can have several studies and each of these studies can have several questionnaires. <laughs> um, on the right side, you see a minimal set of uh, study level information like the publication year, study period, the publisher and some contents. And on this area and, and on this um, user interface, you can um, first of all uh, gain access to a study group. Um, if you're logged in as a new user, you will get your own study group. Um, and then you can of course, create a new study, edit a study, delete a study, and clone a study. And you can create a new questionnaire, edit a questionnaire, delete, and of course, clone a questionnaire. <coughs> um, I will jump now to my uh, edit test questionnaire that I created earlier. So what you see here is that I entered a first question. On the left side, you see the list of questions. I created one question at the moment. On the right side, you can see the um, um, detailed page of this questionnaire. <coughs> so you can see uh, variable names, which is empty. You can see the question. You can see the response scale. You can see the missing values. Um, and um, if I double click on the question, you will get an editor window. And um, in this edit window, you can edit any information that is necessary. For example, I can edit the question pretext, the question text itself, the post text. I can create answers. So, in this case, I created a yes or no answer. I can create a new one if I want to. So um, <coughs> I can, uh, let's say I want to have a Likert scale. Of three, can put in some text, can add here um, the answers. Um, can edit the answer text. And then, uh, I don't know, Likert is, I think, written like that. And then I can use this answer set for any question that I want. Um, so now it's also connected to this uh, Eddie uh, question. And when I save and close, <coughs> we should see in the detail view the new answer scale. Yeah, so we have the answer scale here. Um, what is possible overall, um, you can create a new question. You can create a new matrix question or question grid. Um, 
I will do that right now. So I'm able to enter a new uh, number. I can edit the question title. I can enter a test description again. And the difference to the, to the normal question is that we not only have answers here, so I can actually um, select here again the Likert scale. But I can also create items to that. So I will put in here um, a new item. And by doing so, I have created a question grid with the items A, B, and the response scale one, two, three. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's actually what we wanted. Um, you can, as said, create a new question. That's a normal question. You can create a question grid. You can create also a statement in order to structure the, the questionnaire. Of course, you can edit all these information. Um, we have a special section to manage only the answers. We have a special section to only manage the instructions. Um, and uh, what is pretty new is that we also have now finally then translation connected uh, in, the, um, in the questionnaire editor. So you, um, when you create a new study, you usually start with the source language and then you can translate each question and uh, each statement and of course, uh, there will be also um, a, a translation of instructions and answers. And in, and in this way, um, you are able to translate uh, a questionnaire and all the information is stored in our DDI FlatDB, finally. So what you see here is that we have now the, the I prepared that, that we have the English version and I also created the German version. <coughs> the, question, uh, the question language is showed up here. And what you, what you see here is the German question text and the response scale, which I did not translate yet. That's why it's not shown here. Um, there are some uh, further options beside the editing and creation. Um, you can comment on a question and, and, and statement. You can um, Comment, uh, change the status, that's actually quite nice. That is a collaborative workflow tool. So I can, if I, if I create, have a question and um, let's say you created with several persons a new questionnaire and you want to set this question now fixed, um, I can change the status of the question from draft, for example, to finalized. And uh, if I save this status, the question is not editable anymore. So you cannot edit the question because the admin had says it's finalized. Um, we found that very, very helpful in the workflow because you can, uh, somebody enter the questionnaire and then they have a review phase and or a discussion phase. And then these questions are um, um, checked with the status accordingly. <clears throat> what is also possible is you can mark a question and then it goes to the basket tool and you can take it then over to another questionnaire and paste it there again in order to create your own questionnaire. And what is also possible, you can export the questions, the questionnaire. So if I, if I click on whole questionnaire, I am able to export it to PDF and I can select also the languages here. And then if I download the PDF, <coughs> I get the questionnaire that I have created here with my two questions. Um, the translation is um, actually uh, also quite quite simple. <laughs> we have enabled, I think, uh, German, English, and uh, German and French at the moment. The source language is, of course, here in this case, English. And what you see is you see the pretext, the original pretext, 
and then you can filter, put in the the uh, um, the language that you want to translate to. Um, we learned from the CV manager that it's very helpful to see the original text directly inside uh, the tool. So um, yeah, this is very easy now to translate actually. About five but, minutes later. Thank you. So the, 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 the translation is actually a hard part and um, you all may know that and uh, yeah. Okay, um, so I showed you actually now the question editor. Um, it's functional, it's online. You can test it if you want to. Um, you can ask us to create a, a, a study group for you. And um, I will go back now to the to the slides. Let's see if I can manage the, the right, yeah. So I want to give you a little perspective of the um, question here. So what we, what we did with respect to last year's EDI, the translation module is, um, is ready um, for uh, several languages. Further languages can be added very easily. Um, one major point was that we uh, enabled single sign-on using the OR2 mechanism, inclusive the registration workflow, um, which is uh, kind of hard. So you, you need to register, get the email, and then you are uh, enabled. Um, what we currently work on is to export the DDI file to the European Question Bank. This is ongoing, but should not be a big problem because uh, we stored everything in DDI and the European Question Bank of Chester already uses DDI. So um, this should be a, a, a very nice task to, to fulfill. Um, another, another interesting uh, connection will be the integration with the European Question Bank of Chester. Because if you search for questions in the European Question Bank and store them in the basket tool of the European Question Bank, you should be able to create a directly a new questionnaire. And we want to enable a loose connection between the um, GESIS questionnaire editor and the European Question Bank so that you directly can um, put in a new questionnaire. And um, the other uh, things we want to do is to export, of course, the, the questionnaires to online survey tools like Google Forms, maybe even Unipark if we can get a hand on the input format or tools like SurveyJS, um, which uh, enables you to have a, a JSON uh, um, format of the question and then you can create your own questionnaires with it. Um, actually, we I would really like to see that the questionnaire editor has also a test button so you can test the survey in an online form that would be also very 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 nice to have. Um, a system is available now as I said if you log in and register as a single user you get your own private study group and can create as many studies and questionnaires and tests around as much as you want. If you're an institute um, you can contact us and we will create for you a study group so that everybody in the institute can be connected to the study group and you can work collaboratively on questionnaires. Um, so thank you very much. The URL, uh, this is of course joint work at GESIS. Um, the major developers here is Oliver Hopt and Sigit Nugraha. Um, but there were prior uh, developers also connected to the project. Um, if you want to try it out, um, take the URL below. That's multiwebgesis.org slash questionnaire editor. If you have any questions now, please go ahead. Yeah, we, we have some questions. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have the questions. The first just came in. I'll start with John Johnson's uh, first one. Um, he asks, um, I mean, you mentioned the EQB connection, but his question is if he has the DDIL encoded question somewhere else, can he import them also manually? Um, you cannot import them manually at the moment. Um, if you send us a DDI file, um, we can do it for you. Okay, so an, up, an, an, upload, an upload function would be very handy indeed. But as I will uh, also tell in my next talk, um, DDI is not DDI and um, that is usually a problem. Okay. 
Then uh, the, the second question from Marie Clemola, um, whether it's possible to have different response scales depending on the language, so one, two, three in one question and one, two, five in the translated questionnaire. Um, actually, I don't know. You can create, of course, uh, uh, two quest uh, two answer sets and uh, but I, I think it's it at the moment it is one question connected to one uh, to one answer set um, we didn't have that uh, request yet okay um, maybe just quickly the final question Benjamin Boyster asks Two question actually, can you reuse response scales and categories in your question items or do you create copies? Um, this is reuse actually. Mm -hmm. So we have only one set of answers and you can connect them to each question. And then the second part, uh, how do you link the variables to the questions? In DDIL, the reference is from the variable to the question and not the other way around. Yes, so I didn't show that in the user interface, but you can, uh, there's a variable section, you can edit the variables according to the question, which is then stored in the DDI. Um, Benjamin, you may ask Oliver how he did it, um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's always the complication of the referencing, um, but it is referenced and um, I know that it is, it's working that you can see all the variables regarding the question. Okay, thank you. Then we've answered all the questions. Um, we will now move on to the next talk, which is again held by Klaus Peter. So uh, he can directly continue and I'll not reread the introduction. Uh, this time we're looking at a converter for DDI from Codebook to Lifecycle. The floor is again yours. Thank you very much again. Um, so, um, as I said, um, we, we, during our development of the uh, DDI FlatDB, uh, we came up with the idea of a converter to convert from codebook or older DDI formats um, to DDI lifecycle. And um, if you remember right, we had a bird of feather session last year at uh, Eddie in Tampere. And um, in the meantime, we developed the converter and um, we put it also into a very nice use case, which I will show you. Um, so the agenda for this talk is, I will give you a little in introduction again. I will describe the use case scenarios. I will tell you a little bit of, about the DDI FlatDB, and then I will address the converter a little bit and um, show the use case example of the European Question Bank that goes through the whole talk today and then also some outlook and perspective on this issue. As said, we have at GESIS the DDI environment and even within GESIS we have, um, due to the fact that we have several tools like the DBK editor, the DSDM variable editor and the Codebook Explorer Laura, different tools um, storing um, the, um, the study level information, the variable level information, the questionnaire information in several databases in several formats. And um, as said last year, there is a, there is a need to um, have a converter. And um, I, I just want to mention, uh, uh, ah, I jumped too far, sorry. Somehow I pressed the wrong button. So we identified during our projects in Chester and also in-house um, several problems with or of DDI. So in DDI, we have different versions. I think in, in GESIS, we have um, lifecycle in DDI lifecycle in 3.1, 3.2. We have a codebook uh, also as we have a Nesta or I had a, had a Nesta server. Um, we have now the upcoming DDI CDI. Um, we have different versions in itself and um, but what is the major problem we identified in the European Question Bank uh, harvesting questions is that there is a heterogeneous use of DDI. So in DDI, there are a lot of options to manage and store metadata that can be used, 
and actually they are used. Everybody is doing it on their own premises. That is a real problem. And um, in addition, um, one problem with DDI is that we don't have any open source tools available to um, really uh, put DDI into usage. Um, and um, of course, uh, we have the trouble that the legacy systems uh, slowly run out of support. And uh, that makes it hard to switch. You either have to go to Collectica, where we have the talk uh, after my talk, to a um, um, public um, commercial system. Um, there, there are actually no options at the moment. Every institute, every service provider is doing their own work, uh, running, um, running databases, and that is a hell of a work and, and very complex and also very expensive with resources. Um, as said, we, we found our own solution by developing the DDI FlatDB. Um, the overall goal is that we have an abstract, efficient and functional driven and restful access to studies and study level information and metadata in the DDI format. <laughs> this um, turns out to be working very well. Um, we, we, we can have efficient access to all entities like study unit, questions and items. Um, this is also used, of course, in the question editor. Um, we don't need to reprogram everything. We can keep things configurable with the DDI FlatDB. And by doing so, we have efficient, efficient, we can provide efficient searching for all entities and um, we can provide flexible usage for all possible portals and functionalities. Mm. The current version is on our GitLab of the DDI FlatDB. It's uh, fairly well documented and has a high coverage. And the release is currently the 3.8 release. If you want to take a look, please go ahead. And um, this is actually the basis for our converter. All the work we have done with, with creating the DDI FlatDB and all the knowledge that we gained, uh, we put actually in the DDI converter. So we have uh, several use cases here. Um, one use case will be that um, we want to harvest uh, for the Chester data, Chester metadata catalog. And um, currently uh, their DDI, uh, I think Dublin Core or DDI Codebook is harvested. And it would be great to have these also on the level of DDI lifecycle. We did this already in the European Question Bank. We can harvest and convert various DDI variants on question level metadata and um, use that then for searching actually. I will show you the um, workflow in a second. And of course, um, the, the converter can be used to migrate from older tools to new tools. Um, I, I wasn't able today to show you that we can get a DDI codebook uh, version of the questionnaires into our question editor, but this will be, I think, hopefully done in the next two weeks. It, it's, I think, uh, very nicely possible. Um, within the European Question Bank workflow, um, we start on the top right. So we have several service providers like us in the GESIS, uh, the UK Data Archive, um, and all the other service providers, which we will harvest via OAI PMH. We developed for that also the OAI Harvester again, to gather all the data in a very nice way. <laughs> um, in addition, we also um, enabled a file harvester. So if, if a service provider is not able to provide an OAI interface yet, no OAI server, we can also harvest the files. And the files are then stored first, firstly in our, on our hard drive, but they are immediately pushed to Git repository. So the, um, ev everything runs at the moment through a Git workflow. So all the files, let's say there is a DDI Nesta 1.2.2 version harvested of questions um, goes into our Git. The Git then, if the process is, is done, um, triggers the DDI converter, which takes the, um, 
according to a flag or a, a hook or whatever, um, takes over and um, gets the DDI files, the codebook files from the Git, converts them and puts them into the Git again. Maybe another Git, um, but of course the same system. And then we have the DDI 3.2 CMM formatted um, questionnaires in the Git repository. This is then harvested or ingested into the DDI FlatDB. And then we gain a restful access to all the information necessary. That means that you are able to write one indexer, which for example, takes the FlatDB, the REST interface, and derives a very nice, nice uh, use case specific elastic search index in order to provide a UI in order to search for questions. <clears throat> it is also possible that the user interface, of course, directly connects to the FlatDB in order to get further data that is not yet within the elastic search. But uh, actually, the UI and the elastic search should be one block one component uh, that is used so uh, you don't need to access the flat DB, but you are able to, for example, um, download the complete XML uh, DDI file if you want to. So this workflow actually is in function <coughs> at the Chester European Question Bank. Um, we are currently trying to automate the process further so that um, everything runs smoothly without intervention. And also we want to see that we gain some awareness because um, currently we always take a look at what was harvested, how many questions were harvested, how many questions were converted. Um, does that fit? Is that the same number? Um, and how many questions are then uh, ending in the flat DB? And then how many questions are in the Elasticsearch? And uh, we need to get some awareness of this process in order to state to everybody that the system is up to date, that all the questions are there. <clears throat> I will tell you a little bit now about the uh, uh, converter. So the, the, the main, the, the, so that overall the converter is based on the DDI FlatDB software as said. And the main idea here is to use the DDI entities, which is a Java representation of DDI as a central model for the DDI FlatDB and for the converter. <laughs> and what you usually do is you have, an, have a thing called dialect definition. The dialect definition is the, um, the configuration file that describes the read and write access to any entity in a DDI file. So let's say we take the study title, then we put into this dialect definition for codebook uh, 1.2.2, the XPath expression to access the, the uh, study title. And that is then as uh, with, the, with the DDI file inserted into the DDI converter and um, stored in the DDI entities. And then we have a dialect definition defining the output, let's say DDI 3.2 lifecycle in, uh, in CMM flavor. And then we store it again as this dialect definition defines and we get the DDI XML output file in this case, not input file. <clears throat> if you want to know more about this, uh, feel free to, to uh, ask us. Um, what we learned about DDI again here is the DDI entities in DDI FlatDB gave us 80% of the converter. <clears throat> but of course, as you may know, if you are familiar with DDI, a codebook and life cycle uh, are different and hold different challenges. So um, the codebook, for example, is very variable centric and questions are usually connected to the variables. And also the same holds true for answers and categories, answer categories. And in this case, we needed to implement um, a structure to do the conversion for these specific informations. For, for example, study unit uh, uh, metadata, there is actually no problem to convert from one to another, but there are some structural changes that need to be reflected. And um, yeah, it, it simply works and that's the goal of the tool. <clears throat> What's the current status of the DDI converter? We have uh, several dialect definitions. Um, 
for inputs such as Nesta, Codebook 1.2.2 and Codebook 2.5. Uh, we also can access DDI Lifecycle 3.1 um, and we can output any higher version actually. And we have the output to DDI Lifecycle 3.2. Within the European Question Bank, we have um, created specific dialect definitions for the specific service providers which is actually copy and paste of the original Nesta codebook and then do some adaptions because, and that is the general problem, um, and DDI is used at will and um, is, is, is um, everybody is using it at their will. It, all the things are different, we found out. Um, and that makes it kind of hard and, uh, but nevertheless, with the, current DDI, FlatDB, converter and, and dialect definitions. Um, it is not a matter of programming anything new. You just need to define the dialect definition and then you can use based on existing dialect definitions and you don't need to implement anything in order to adapt to a new set of DDI files coming from any service provider. And that was also a, a very handy and um, the goal. <laughs> so um, the the re Four, five, five minutes, minutes left. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Um, so um, I just wanted to show you the actual result here. Um, the European Question Bank. Uh, this is a screenshot of the result list. So uh, we are able to. I I don't know the correct number, but it was definitely more than thirty thousand questions uh, can be searched in the current development environment of the European Question Bank. You have all the features that that are necessary. Um, you can search in all the languages. Uh, you have the basket ability. You can have a comparison view. You see the question text. Um, you can get get the question details. That is on on this page. <coughs> um, so question text, sub question number, uh, the response scales and categories are shown. Also grids are handled um, very nicely. Um, you can select by languages, all the filters are enabled. And um, I think without the FlatDB and without the converter, we, we could not have managed um, to gather these heterogeneous DDI uh, data from all the service providers. Um, some perspectives. Um, we will uh, most probably extend further dialect definitions for more Chester service providers in the future. Um, we want to, uh, one major problem is, uh, of course, we, we, we did not cover all DDI possibilities. One possibility is to handle versioning. Um, we may extend this in the next year. And um, one thing we want to do is we want to provide an on online version of the converter. So you can try it out on yourself. You can select the input DDI. You can upload your file, click on convert and prior select the output uh, uh, that you want to have. And then you can download your own uh, DDI file in the converted version for testing. So thank you again. Um, I, I need to mention here Alex Mühlbauer, who did a hell of a job creating the DDI FlatDB and also creating it in such a way that it has a very nice coverage. It's very nice reusable. Um, I just want to mention that. So if you have any questions, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Peter. So. Um... You can, uh, just to repeat, you can use the Q&A function of Zoom to ask questions. I will then uh, read out the question without mentioning names. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask the question live. We have the first question that is, would you recommend a conversion tool to migrate from DDI Codebook 1.2 Nesta to DDI Codebook 2.5 Dataverse? Um, actually, we didn't try that out yet. Um, it may be possible with our conversion tool. I would need to check that. But I think Nesta 1.2.2 and Codebook 2.5 are not that different. I would uh, suggest to, to uh, contact Oliver Hopt in this case because he knows that uh, very well. So just because you're always to, to, uh, to, to life cycle, right? 
Yes, yes. Okay, and if I understand correctly, in this case, the code is available to download uh, and use on yourself, but it's you're also working on a hosted version. That's what you said last, right? Yes, right. Yeah. So what do I need to run it locally? Is this a command line tool or is this, what does that look like? Um, yes, actually it's a command line tool. Um, you specify the um, dialect definition input, the file and the output, and um, you can run it. I think it's, it should be, I'm not really sure, but there should be a Dockerized version so you can download the Docker and run within it. I Please, please connect to Alex. Uh, he knows it by heart and uh, would be the right person to ask. Okay, I don't see any further questions for now. Then uh, thanks again, Peter. And we move on to the third talk. The third talk will be given by Dan Smith, who works for Collectica, then is a partner at Collectica and a member of the DDI Technical Committee. He was previously at IBM's Advanced Internet Technologies Group, focusing on semantic web technologies. Dan, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Carson. And hello, everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about Collectica version 6. Collectica version 6 is our new version that we released this past summer, and it now includes support for DDI 3.3. Um, this upgrade has been done in all of our tools, including Collectica Designer, Collectica Questionnaires, Blaze Collectica Questionnaires, and our server tools, the Collectica Repository and Portal. So today what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we implemented 3.3, give some tips to people who are also upgrading their tools from 3.2 to 3.3, and then talk about a couple new features that we have in some of our tools. So one of the things people know about DDI lifecycle is that there's been several versions of it. And between some of the versions, there are some differences. So since 2005, we've had four different versions of DDI lifecycle now. Now Collectica supports DDI 3.1, 3.2, and now 3.3 all at the same time. So I'm gonna explain a little bit about how we did that. So what we do internally is we have a model of all of the DDI items that are available. And we've created mappers to DDI codebook and DDI 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3. So to talk a little bit about this Collectica model, uh, you can think of it as a common representation of all of the DDI item types. And we use it in an object-oriented class library, but it's stored as um, individual items and the relationships between items. And much of what we do with this model is set based in graph operations, um, looking at relationships, looking at the individual items themselves. And this whole model is included in our Collectica SDK. So we went to implement uh, DDI 3.3. And the way that we tested that was we created um, an instance in the model. We wrote it out to 3.3. Then we read it back into the model then we wrote it out to 3.3 again. We then compared those two DDI instances um, to make sure they're exactly the same. So that gives us pretty good coverage for 3.3, but then what about supporting all the other versions simultaneously as well? So what we do for that is a, a similar testing scenario where we write out 3.3, read it back in, write out 3.2, read it back in, write out 3.3 again, and then read that back in and compare the 3.3 instances. So this kind of gives us proof that um, we're writing out the same content in every and reading in the same content in every version of DDI. So this lets us give some guarantees to the users. One is that um, Collectica is always backwards compatible. We can always read and write um, prior versions of DDI. So if you're using Collectica version five and have DDI 3.2 in your repository, when you upgrade to Collectica six, 
you'll start having DDI 3.3 in your repository, but all the other metadata can still be uh, read and written. Um, so for forward compatibility with older systems, for instance, if there's a system um, that only supports DDI 3.2, what we do for that is for within item types that exist in that version, all of the new content and features we try to backport into our 3.2 and 3.1 support using user attributes in 3.2 and notes in 3.1. So a comment about DDI 3.3, unlike past version jumps from 3.0 to 3.1 or 3.1 to 3.2, this version was very backwards compatible. The majority of the changes in our 3.3 implementation and in the 3.3 standard were just new additions of additional content. There wasn't a lot of changes you had to make to your existing support. Um, so this made it very straightforward for us to implement 3.3. In fact, we actually rely on most of our 3.2 processing to do all of the 3.3 processing as well. Um, and this was also the quickest upgrade we've ever had from a new DDI lifecycle release. So going from 3.1 to 3.2, took quite a bit of time because there were um, more than just feature additions. <laughs> there are lots of changes in that version, but going from 3.2 to 3.3 um, was very smooth. And um, it really just proves how DDI lifecycle has matured now. Um, there's one thing that I do wanna point out for when people are upgrading their tools from 3.2 to 3.3, and that is that the other materials have changed a little bit. In prior versions, they were embedded into all of the DDI items. So for instance, if you had a study unit item, other materials would just be content within that study unit. Now, other materials can be uniquely identified and shared as well, just like other DDI item types. Um, so in this um, part of the upgrade, you do have to do a little bit extra work to extract the other materials from the 3.2 and then write them out as items in 3.3. Um, and so in our desktop tools, we've uh, made that an automatic conversion when you save into 3.3. So that was a little bit about our 3.3 implementation. Now I'd like to... Uh, talk about a couple of my favorite features um, in the new version six. So in Collectica Portal, um, a couple great new features we have are classification management and display. Uh, this was content that was added into DDI 3.3 and it was based on the Neuchatel classification model, which is now managed by GSIM. Um, there's improvements to quality standards and quality statements and some cross-study harmonization support and um, additional logging and dashboards. So you can figure out, you know, how are your users using the portal? You can get dashboards about new users, what they visit, how they search. Yeah, so the new classifications in Collectica version six are all based on DDI 3.3 now. Previously, we supported classifications using DDI 3.2 and what's called the Copenhagen mapping, which was made by Statistics Denmark, which allowed additional um, properties to be stored on DDI code lists to kind of treat them as classifications. But now with version six, we support classifications directly as it's directly supported in the standard. Um, we also have a converter. So if people using Collectica version five and the Copenhagen mapping for classifications can convert those into the DDI 3.3 classification model. So another new thing on, shown on the portal is quality standards. So in DDI 3.2, quality statements were supported, but there was no ability to define standards themselves. So in DDI 3.3, that's now available. And we also have an upgrade for the way we supported quality standards in 3.2 to convert to the new um, DDI 3.3 uh, quality standards. My third new favorite feature on Portal is the uh, cross-study concordance. Um, so 
what this means is if you have multiple institutions that have their own sets of conceptual variables and their studies documented in DDI, it would be very useful if you could take a look at them across institutions. Um, so for this, we needed a way to map conceptual variables and say that they were similar or the same, even though they have different identities. Um, I'm not gonna go too much into this because there's two great sources you can find out more about this. One was uh, Jeremy's session yesterday about cross-study variable concordance. And there's another uh, done by ICPSR um, that is now available on YouTube for the webinar recording that explains the entire process in, in great detail, even more detail than in Jeremy's session. So if you're interested in cross-study concordance features in Collectica 6, I'd recommend um, looking at those two links. And I'll make sure to send my slides in to get posted on the Zenodo um, so you can click those links. I know <laughs> you might not be able to see them in the, the Zoom meeting, um, the actual web URLs for those. So um, there's also several new features in Collectica repository version six. Um, a lot of times Collectica repository, it's difficult to show things because it's really a server and a bunch of web services. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about a couple new features under the hood that you won't be able to see, but really make a big difference um, in Collectica version six. So the first thing, the first new feature that Collectica repository has is a new transaction API. So this API allows you to create, update, cancel, and commit transactions on the server itself. It also has really fine grain control over how the versions of those items are stored and how the versions propagate within the repository. So by version propagation, what I mean is, let's say you have a code list that changes. Well, that will change the version of questions that reference it, change the versions of variables that reference it, could change the studies that reference those data sets in those with those variables, with those code lists. So when you make changes in DDI, it's great because it always gives you a point in time version of all your metadata, but that is, a little bit difficult to manage sometimes. Um, so we've done that in Collectica Designer and Collectica Questionnaires for users for a very long time. So with this new uh, transaction API, we're allowing developers to use this transaction API to handle all of that um, version propagation and versioning automatically as well. So there's a couple types of transactions. Um, I won't go into too much detail in these. I just wanted to list them. So if people were very interested, they could take a look later and see the different types of transactions. Um, the first would be copy commit, which would just be copying the DDI directly into the repository without doing any um, changes to the versioning. Commit as latest would commit it as a latest version and update the version number. Commit latest with chil latest children would update the version number, and then make sure all of the references were to the latest children items in the repository. We also have two more advanced types of transactions. One is committing as latest and propagating the versions. So it can, you can, for example, add a variable, and then you can say everywhere within this study, anywhere that points at that variable, I want it to point to the latest version. You could also say, anywhere across the entire repository, I want anything that references that variable to point to the latest version. So that's a pretty powerful feature for developers and it saves them quite a bit of time on the version management because all they have to think about now is, uh, for example, going to the repository and looking at a version, changing the description, and then adding that uh, variable back into the repository within a transaction with one of these transaction types set and all of the versioning and propagation will be done for them on the server side. So that's a, a new feature that we're very thrilled about too because we're hoping that we can start using it in some of our tools and uh, make our lives easier as well. So another uh, new feature in repository is we've modified how all of the metadata items are stored. 
So when uh, large customers have very large implementations, they can have hundreds of gigabytes of metadata items, especially when you think about all of the different versions and audit trails that are created. So we've updated the storage layout in version six so that items that are um, connected to each other with relationships. So for example, uh, concepts might be connected to other concepts or a variable might be connected to a code list, which would be connected to several categories. Those items are placed near each other. And we also place newer items together as well. So what this new layout does is for very, very large um, stores of metadata, it uh, increases the page table hit rates on the backend storage. And that can increase throughput and lower the amount of hardware resources customers have to have. Um, and so this also still preserves all of the audit trail functionality, but makes um, the hardware requirements less. And this isn't just for very large customers. It also helps small deployments because um, if you have a smaller deployment, you can still have that deployment on a smaller set of hardware resources. So this is a great update for everybody using the repository. So there's about five minutes left. Yep. So we, I don't have much time left. So I just wanted to say that there's hundreds of new features and updates in version six. Those are just some of my favorite, but you can see um, the complete list of all of the changes on our documentation website under the Collectica version six change log. And now that I've told you all about version six, I wanna tell you just a little bit about version seven and some of the exciting things coming there. So the first thing that's, uh, people have been asking for is a way to deploy Collectica on Linux. So that is now coming in Collectica version seven, along with um, some more orchestration for scale out and support for a couple more metadata standards on top of all the DDI versions that we support. And you can find all of that information on our Collectica roadmap. And if you have more questions about Collectica, we have weekly webinars uh, demonstrations over Zoom and software evaluations. So if you'd like any of uh, that information, you can go to collectica.com and click on the evaluate button and send us the message. So with that, we can take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, there is uh, the first question, whether you can show an example of how to use managed classifications in Collectica 6. Um, sure. So classifications are very much like code lists. And the way that they're used in Collectica version 6 is in Collectica Designer, it now has full support for editing the seven new types that were added in DDI 3.3. So you can create classification families, classification series, the classifications themselves, all of the statistical classification items, and maps between the different items. So the way to use and manage them would be to first uh, create a classification, much like you would have created a code list in the past. There's just a couple more uh, properties that you'll be able to set. And then you can use that classification um, in certain other item types, such as variables, to say this variable has, uh, instead of a code list, it might have a classification as its uh, format or description. Okay, thank you. Um, we're open for further question. We also have a full 15 minutes left to answer any question that you want to answer in general. One thing that came to my mind, uh, you mentioned the, this new graph model, um, realizing data as, as graphs. I mean, there's other applications that spring to mind, linked data, thoughts, uh, open knowledge graphs, all these kinds of things. Is this something you have planned? or even done already, implemented already? Yeah, so when we first created the Collectica repository, um, it was influenced very much by my previous work at IBM, um, where I was working on semantic web technologies. And all of the information that's stored in the repository is stored as a graph. So we store the items and we store the relationships between them. Um, and 
almost all the operations that we do and our web services on the repository also provide those types of relationship search, um, set search, searching within a set. And by set, I mean connected items within that graph area. So for example, a set of items could be a study that has a metadata package or resource package with a data set, with variables, with code lists, with categories, as an example. So specifying that top level study, we could say a set of all the items in that study are all the connected items. And then we have web services that let you search just within that area. Um, and the way we implement that is by storing each identified DDI item individually. So we don't have files of DDI, we have uh, a fragment for each identified and registered item in the repository. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of how the repository treats DDI okay. as a graph. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we we take other questions first. Um, not not comparing it directly to the um, uh, DDI FlatDB that Peter was mentioning earlier, but one of the questions answers is uh, where do you find more information about the weekly webinars you mentioned? Yes, yeah, so each week we do uh, introductory webinars for uh, new customers or prospective customers. So if you'd like to get more information about any of our tools or see them in detail, um, you can send us a message and we can set up an introductory webinar. Okay, thank you. And uh, then next question. Um, Good improvements in version six and coming seven. Are there plans to introduce DDI CDI? Yep, once it's released, um, we'll definitely take a look at their support for the variable cascade because that complements DDI lifecycle very well. The, the two products are made to work together. Um, so that's definitely something we'll be looking at. Okay, I don't have any further questions right now? Um, I mean, the, the, the one thing I mentioned, you mentioning the, the, the graph model, Klaus Peter, you had the DDI flat DB where everything is a file. Um, is that is there any, any relation, any thoughts on this, either of you? Um, okay, otherwise, we'll, we'll take one of the more qualified questions from the audience. Uh, what about SDTL? Um, sure, I'll take this one. Um, so SDTL is a project that um, we've been working on with the University of Michigan and Metadata Technologies and NSD um, and a couple other academic partners to create a language to document data transformations. And it's now been approved as a standard of the DDI Alliance. Um, so DDI has places where you can insert um, domain specific code um, to describe different transformations or logic. So that would be a place that SDTL could be incorporated. Um, we have not, uh, had a plan when we're going to include that into Collectica, but we will at some point as um, we, we think it would be pretty beneficial for tracking lineage through data transformations. Carson, you are muted. But uh, I will just continue and uh, take a look at John's question here. Um, he asked about uh, to be able to reflect on proliferation of DDI flavors. Um, this is something we really found out in the European Question Bank. All the service providers that we uh, talk to have different DDI versions and different DDI usages. And um, I think what is really necessary is that there are tools and standards and governance um, 
and I, as I said, I think at the uh, Eddy in in uh, in Switzerland two years or three years ago on the panel, I, I really see that Chester could uh, provide governance by stating that if you want to join Chester and use the Chester tools, the uh, code, uh, the Chester data catalog, you should reflect to the standardized lifecycle CMM model. And that would be very good because that makes things very easy or easier. <laughs> sure, I have a couple comments on that too. Um, so one of the things that I think makes interoperability harder is when people um, think of DDI as documents with X paths and different routes that different items can be in instead of being unique items that are identified and versioned that are linked to other items. Um, so the DDI Technical Committee has put out a best practices paper for how to use DDI lifecycle. And one of the things that it recommends is using the DDI fragment instances to enforce, um, you know, thinking of DDI items as individual uh, entities. So for example, a question is always a question. It doesn't matter if it's in an instance, in a study, in a metadata package, in a question scheme, and then there's a question. So um, by thinking of DDI more as a graph with you know, individually identified items and the relationships between them, instead of what is the list of relationships I have to search to find a certain thing in a certain document, I think that could really improve interoperability. Um, so if people want to learn a little bit more about that, they can go to the DDI website and on the lifecycle page, there's links to the uh, DDI best practices paper. And this is in uh, part three about serialization. And I think that is probably one of the easiest things people can do to make all of their tools more interoperable. Okay, thank you. Um, there was one more question, whether there are also available, uh, webinars available for current user, not just for future customers. I think this was to Dan. Sure, so that's something that we've um, now started as well. Um, so we used to do on-site workshops and training sessions, um, but this year we are unable to do those. So we've started doing uh, virtual training sessions. Um, so that's now an option that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a bit of time left if there are further questions. I can't currently see them. There have also not been any questions in the Discord. This is the last chance. Otherwise, um, thank you both, Dan and Peter, very much for your presentations, for answering the questions. Uh, and then we end this final.